Thank you. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, this is an unexpected pleasure for me. I got the call today about noontime. Uh, Rihanna was going to come in and spend a couple of hours with me going through my sources in my, my house. And instead, I got a phone call, and she says, I'm in Vermont. I said, well, gee, I said, uh, that means we aren't going to meet. She says, no, Philadelphia is fogged in. So I said to myself, oh, great, now I can work on the book I was working on at the time, the whole day and whole evening, I won't lose any time. So I uh, came downstairs to tell my wife, and the phone rang, and it was Mike. And he said, help, can you come over and pitch in? So I agreed. Uh, I won't pass up any opportunity to talk about my life's work, which is studying the Soviet-German War, 1941 to 45. Now, I understand I'm a substitute tonight. I understand a lot of you folks came to hear Rihanna talk about wings, women, and war. So if anything comes up that in, in what I say that relates to women, and you have a question, put the hand up. And at the end, if you want to ask some questions about women and war, I can, I can feel she's the expert, but I've done some work in it, and I can field questions for you. Aside from that, what I'm going to do tonight is run through the entire war very quickly. Now, this presentation is designed to go anywhere from one hour to seven hours. Uh, I've got to do it in 45 minutes. So what I've decided, based on past experience, is that I'll go through as much as I can get through because I think I can make the points I want to make, even if I don't cover the entire alphabet from A to Z, the entire war from 1941 to 1945. I entitled the presentation, Myths and Realities, because the history of the war is indeed replete with myths. And with the burgeoning amount of archival materials now coming out, coming out roughly since the early 1990s, unfortunately not being exploited enough, we can now underscore some of those vivid realities that counter the myths that are in so many history books written prior to the year 2000. I'm going to add a couple of introductory remarks, and what I'm going to do is dispense with those entirely. Suffice it to say that the Soviet-German conflict was a war in the 20th century without comparison to other wars. In terms of its scale, in terms of its scope, in terms of its consequences, in terms of its tremendous toll, material toll, and personnel toll. It was, in fact, what the Germans would call a culture kampf, or a culture war. A war between cultures or between civilizations where the attacking and defending armies often asked for no quarter and gave none. It was a war of ideology. And as we are learning today, ideological wars, religion being an ideology, can also be fierce wars and ones not easily resolved. Now, what I'm going to do is go through a couple of gee whiz slides that give you some taste of the scope of this struggle. Uh, admittedly, these are numbers and figures, but I think they'll give you some kind of, of idea of what we're dealing with here, something that is almost outside the imagination of any American, certainly outside of our military experience. Then I'm going to walk you through the war a campaign at a time. There were eight wartime campaigns, basically campaigns cut, covered during seasons of the year. I'm going to highlight within each of those campaigns what the major myths have been, what my answer, and I underscore my answer to that myth is, and what, what some of the realities are. And the theme that, that should permeate this whole presentation is that some 40% of the record of the war on Germany's eastern front remains forgotten, covered up, ignored, there are lots of reasons for it, but essentially forgotten. We're now in a position where we can restore that 40%. I'm not talking about the forgotten battles, unlike Moscow and Stalingrad and Kursk and Belarusia and Vistula Oder and Berlin. I'm talking about forgotten battles of an equal scale. I'm talking about major elements of those famous ones we already know about, major elements that have been also covered up for a variety of reasons. If I do this by getting through 43, fine. If I can get through 1945, fine. But throughout, if something comes up that you have a question on, rather than have you forget it until the end, put the hand up, and I'm willing to stop and address your question, and I'll simply tailor my remarks accordingly. 
You can cut the, the lights off up front if you like to, because there is no script for this. What I have on this slide are some of the indices of the scale of operations. And what I've tried to do is compare the arena of combat on the German Eastern Front with uh, U.S. terminology, U.S. geography, just to give you an idea of the scope we're talking about. And I'm going to go through these rather quickly. The combat front itself, the initial front of Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion, 1,720 miles wide. That's the same distance as along the east coast from northern Maine to southern Florida. The initial main attack of the Barbarossa front, that's where the bulk of German attacking forces were deployed. New York City to North Florida, 820 miles. And you'll see how many millions of men we're talking about in just a moment. The maximum extent of the front in 1942, 1,900 miles, the same distance from the mouth of the St. Lawrence River to southern Florida. And the maximum extent in 1942 of the main fighting, Austin, Texas, to the Canadian border. This is indeed continental in its scope. The depth of the German advance, Hitler's Barbarossa objectives insofar as they can be defined, and they weren't very well defined, 1,050 miles. That's the same distance as from the U.S. East Coast, the Atlantic Coast, to Kansas City, Missouri. The maximum extent of the German advance, 760 miles, New York to Springfield, Ohio. And the maximum extent in 1942, 1075, East Coast to Topeka, Kansas. That's a large area, a large area indeed. How about in terms of force size? Here are a couple of numbers and figures. June 1941, Axis forces of 3 point, almost 3.8 million, over 3 million of those German, facing 2.7 million, almost 2.7 Soviet soldiers, maybe 5.5 million overall active duty with another 5 million mobilizable. June 42, Axis strength, 3.7 uh, million, 80% of the German army, 2.7 million in the east, facing over 5 million, 5.3 million Soviet forces. An interesting figure here, if you look at the delta here between what was available in June 41 and what was there in June 42, you'll have somewhere in the excess of 6 to 7 million men lost in that first, first year of war. Staggering losses. July 43, 3.9 million Axis, 3.5 of those Germans, 63% of the German army in the east, against roughly 6.7 million Soviet troops. June 44, 3.4 million, 2.5 million of those Germans, 62% of the German army. 62% of the German army still in the east in June 44 against 4.6 million Soviets. And in January 45, you can see the numbers on the German side diminish. The Soviet numbers remain relatively stable. Still 60% of the German army in the east. And April 45, 1.9 million versus 6.4 million. These are large numbers when you consider that the U.S. armed forces mobilized roughly 8.8 .8 million men throughout the entire war. The Soviets lost about that number in, 19, in the first 18 months of war. A little bit about the casualty toll. Here are the casualty figures, at least as they're officially reported. Red Army casualties, 1941 through 1945, you see it year by year, of which these are irrevocable, they call them, or irreplaceable, killed, missing, or captured, 10 point, over 10 million, armed forces 11 million. The actual figure, if, if my friends in the, art, in the archives of the main cadres directorate are correct, is probably closer to somewhere around 14.7 million men. Keep this in mind when you Think about the casualty toll as bad as it is in Iraq over the past three years, 3,500. A Soviet division going into Stalingrad could lose twice that many men in a week in dead alone. German permanent losses in the east, dead, missing, or disabled. The numbers are here. You can see 900,000 in the first, uh, from 39 to 42, over 90 percent in the east, September 42, November 43. Over 2 million, 90 percent in the east. Just look at the percentages in the east. June to November 44, 62 percent in the east. December to April 45, 67 percent in the east. 
The German army literally perished in the east. And that's why if you walk through the cemeteries in Garmisch or other German towns and read the tombstones, you'll see Tote in Austin, Tote in Austin, Tote in Austin. If you talk to veterans, if they're any alive, you'll be hard-pressed to find one who fought allies, and not Russians. Total armed forces losses for Germany, 10.5, almost 10.6 million, 80 percent in the east. And we always forget the Axis allies. If you look at the casualties of the Axis allies, Hungary, 350,000 dead and missing, Romania, 480,000. Those numbers are almost equal to or exceed the U.S. Death, military death toll in the entire war. And you can see the total figures here. Staggering for nations of that size. So this was a conflict that consumed tens of millions. The Soviets traditionally, and the Russians today, study war as a science. As something that can be studied, measured, to improve one's future performance. Of course, it's also an art, but it's also a science. So a science and an art. And hence, they have divided the war into periods, the first period, the second period, the third period. Now, these period, this periodization changes over the years. Initially, for the first ten years after the war, they treated it in four periods. But basically, this tool of periods simply enabled the analysts looking at military operations to identify the chief characteristic feature. In the first period of the war, clearly Germany with the brief exception of the winter of 41 and 42, held the strategic initiative. The second period of war was clearly a period of transition. This is the period of Kursk and post-Kursk. And the third period of the war from January uh, through 44 and 45, the Soviet Union held the strategic initiative. And within each of these periods, there are, there are specific campaigns, a total of eight. And I'm going to use that campaign framework, beginning with the Barbarossa campaign of the summer of 41, to talk about those portions of the historical record that are flagrantly missing. Now, at the beginning of each of these campaigns, I'll throw up a slide that's got a lot of numbers on it. Basically, I prepared this slide because it gives you some ideal idea of the relative scale and scope of what's going on in the West as opposed to what's going on in the East. And very frankly, at least until the summer of 44, What's going on in the West pales by comparison to what's going on in the East by almost every indices. June 41, U.S. Congress at peace. In October, the Congress renewed the draft, as you recall, by one vote. The U.S. Army strength, 1.5 million men. The same month, the same month, or June, Hitler's Wehrmacht invades the Soviet Union with a force of over 3 million men, crushed Red Army forces in the border region, and shattered the Red Army, advancing on Leningrad, Moscow, and Rostov. The 5 million man Red Army lost 2.8 million by 1 October, 1.6 million more by 31 December. During this period, they raised 821 division equivalents, 483 rifles, 73 tanks, 31 mechanisms, and so on down the line, and lost a total of 229 division equivalents. That's like losing the entire United States Army today 30 times over. In October 41, Stalin evacuated the bulk of the Soviet government to Kribyshev. The Wehrmacht began its final advance on Moscow in November. Now, U.S. Lend-Lead aid, November 41, extended to the Soviet Union and the Battle of Britain and the British offensive in North Africa. I'm not going to dwell on these slides very long because we don't really have time to do it. But if you take a glance at them, you'll see, at least in terms of the numbers, the disparity between scope and scale in the two major theaters of war. Now, this map kind of captures in gross form the nature, the course and nature of the summer fall, the summer fall campaign of June to December 1941. This is the campaign of Barbarossa, generally characterized as a massive and seamless German advance beginning on 22 June 41 and terminating on the 4th of December 1941, which initially encircles many Soviet armies in the border districts, five here, four, five more here at Kiev, and ends up with German forces at the gates of Moscow by early December. And yet if you take a careful look now based on the news sources 
at the course of this campaign, it was by no means as easy as previous books have described. In fact, throughout the entire campaign, the Red Army attempted on several occasions to mount strategic counteroffensives, much less counterstrokes of operational scale and numerous counterattacks, often producing bloody fighting on both sides. For example, on the 28th of June, 1941, as Army Group South, with its first Panzer Group, was advancing eastward toward Kiev, Zhukov himself, Chief of Staff of the Soviet Army, came to the front and implemented a major counteroffensive using six of the Southwestern Front's mechanized corps. This, in fact, is the biggest tank battle in World War II, and scarcely a word has been written on it. 5,000 Soviet tanks, 3,000 of which make it to the battlefield, most of which are destroyed, roughly 300, 350 German tanks in this fight in the Dubno and Brody area. Or up in Lithuania and Latvia, and later the approaches to Leningrad, where the Soviets launched two major multi-army counter-strokes. One near Rasenai, and one up near Staraya Rusa, uh, both of which delay the German advance on Leningrad, each of the, uh, the counter-strokes roughly a week to a week and a half, ultimately throwing the German timetable off in the advance on Leningrad costing the 8th Panzer Division at one point, after it was encircled, most of its armored strength and ripping it out of Army Group's order of battle for the, for the next five months. It wouldn't take, participate in the battle for Leningrad, and that's one of the reasons Leningrad didn't fall. Or in, in late August 41, a massive Soviet offensive by the, the <clears throat> Reserve Western and Bryansk fronts against German Army Group Center east of Smolensk, a huge offensive right into the teeth of Guderian's Panzer forces as they advanced south towards Kiev. This offensive, not a word has been written about in the past 50 years. It cost the Red Army almost 500,000 casualties, and when the Germans resumed their drive on Moscow on, 31, on 30 September 1941, that's why they make the initial progress they do. So there are a host of forgotten battles in the 41 Barbarossa campaign. This is a chart that we, we sh if we'd had time to study it, and that's what you really have to do with it, shows you the forgotten battles on the right and the known ones on the left. But the main part of the chart are these <clears throat> myths that have grown out of the war. The myth of Stalin was planning to conduct a preventative war. This is the Suvorov uh, theory, uh, largely built out of whole cloth. In fact, the counter-offensive Zhukov launches against the German army after it began its invasion was based on the order that Suvor uh, issued 15 May 41 that Suvorov claimed was essentially an order that showed Stalin was going to launch a preventative war. Someone may want to answer about that's a question about that later. I'd be glad to get into it in more detail. The time of Operation Barbarossa. Many have said the Germans should have begun Barbarossa much earlier that it would have succeeded. And yet, if you look at the climatic, climatic conditions in Europe, if you look at the rainy season that came late, you'll realize that, in fact, 22 June was as early as Hitler could begin the Barbarossa Offensive. Guderian's southward turn, this refers to the decision by Hitler and Guderian to, to turn Guderian's second Panzer Group south towards Kiev rather than send it on to Moscow in September 1941 to encircle the Soviet southwestern fronts. In fact, careful study of this maneuver will show you that it was in concert with the original Barbarossa plan, which did mandate such changes in the direction of the attack were they necessary. And by removing a million Soviet troops, by virtue of the Kiev encirclement, this certainly facilitated German operations and didn't delay them. Had the Germans marched on Moscow in September 41, they would have marched on Moscow with a force of a million men in its southern flank. Given the problems they ran into in, in late November, this would have been probably a fatal flaw. And what if Moscow fell? I still have Russian friends who will tell me, these are Russians themselves who lived during the war years or shortly thereafter, who still tell me that had Moscow fallen, uh, the Soviet Union would have certainly lost the war. My own personal opinion is this is untrue. I am convinced that Stalin would have conducted an operation similar to that at Stalingrad a year later, 
put forces into the city. And if he hadn't, if he'd abandoned the city a la Kutuzov in 1812, isolated German forces that far forward would have been very severely harried uh, in the course of the winter campaign of 1941 and 42. Everybody forgets the number of armies the Soviets mobilized in the summer and fall of 1941, between 35 and 40 armies mobilized and fielded during that time. And these are the folks who gave you the uh, strategic victory at Moscow in December. Turning to the winter campaign of 1942, I'm going to skip over the comparison slide and get you right into the campaign itself. Obviously, the centerpiece of this campaign is the Soviet Moscow, the Red Army's Moscow counteroffensive. It actually began as a series of counterattacks because no one, Shukov and Stalin included, believed the Red Army was capable of driving the Germans back in a major victory. However, the counterattacks by armies turned successful, and therefore they extended them into counterstrokes, contra udar and ultimately in January to a counteroffensive that embraced almost the entire Eastern Front, German Eastern Front. Large chunks of this winter campaign have been missing. For example, the attack by the Second Shock Army in the north across the Volkov River, south of Leningrad, to get into Army Group North's rear and liberate the city, in the course of which the Second Shock Army was encircled in the swamps near Luiban, west of the Volkov. Uh, a certain general, a very successful general, uh, was sent in to, <coughs> to take over that army. Vlasov was his name. He had commanded a mechanized corps successfully in 41. He had commanded the 20th Army brilliantly at Moscow, and now he was being sent in to rescue Second Shock. And we know the story. Second Shock was digested by the Germans, surrounded and destroyed in the summer of 1942, Vlasov taken captive and Vlasov going over to the German side. That was a complete blank page in Soviet military history for 45 to 50 years. Now the page is wide open for historians and readers alike to view. The Moscow offensive itself, we know about the attacks in the Moscow area and just to the north, but we had no idea that the area to the south, uh, the armies in the <clears throat> Belov, Orel areas, and, and further to the south toward Belgorod, Belgorod were also or organized heavy offensive operations. It, simply, in a nutshell, the strategic counteroffensive launched by the Red Army in the winter of 1941 and 42 was far larger than any current histories describe. New histories will be required to actually capture the scopes of those operations. As far as the historical debates are concerned, Hitler's standfast order. Hitler was very severely criticized throughout the war for his tendency to order his forces to dig in. This occasion, the winter of 1941-42, was one of those few occasions where, had he not ordered his forces to dig in, it is very likely the German army, the Wehrmacht, would have suffered a defeat somewhat comparable, probably not as large scale, as Napoleon's defeat in 1812. They would certainly have been forced to abandon all territory forward of Smolensk. In this case, Hitler had a proper assessment of the fragility of the Soviet troops conducting the counteroffensive. Stalin's broad front strategy. This is the beginning of a long debate. Soviet uh, books and even Russian books today have long maintained that in the summer of 1941, in the winter of 41-42, Stalin mounted attacks on too broad a front. That is, he mounted offensive operations from Leningrad in the north all the way to Rostov in the south. And this was a dissipation of strength, a lack of concentration of effort, and hence the offensers failed. Now, that is correct about the winter of 41 and 42. But what is incorrect is that most historians say that beginning in the summer of 42, Stalin changed that style and began selecting major strategic axes along which to concentrate his forces. In fact, as we'll see on later slides, in virtually every campaign, regardless of what season of the year it was, Stalin adhered to a policy of amounting as many strategic offensives in as many sectors as possible on the presumption that if you pressure the Germans everywhere, they will break somewhere. And that is the policy he will follow almost till war's end. 
And Moscow is the turning point. There's been a long debate among historians over what were the turning points of the war. The way I view it, there are three turning points. Moscow, Stalingrad, and Kursk. Moscow indicated to the world that Hitler could no longer win the war on his terms, on the terms enunciated in his Barbarossa directive. Stalingrad a year later, and I'll say this in advance, we want to address it when we get to that slide. A year later at Stalingrad, the German, the, the Soviet victory indicated that Hitler would lose the war. The only question remaining was how badly would he lose the war? Would it be total defeat or would it be partial? And Kursk in the summer of 43 answered that both of those questions, victory would be total and it would not come before Soviet forces were in Berlin. I want to go back to this slide, the summer fall campaign. No, uh, no, I'm not going to do that one. The winter campaign. Now, this is one figure I want to show you for comparison's sake. That is so, so, Soviet historians have rightfully thrown in our faces for years. Since nobody reads Russian, no Americans could read this. But they are correct. And that's comparing Stalingrad and El Alamein as equal in stature. Here's the summer fall campaign. This is the campaign of Operation Blau. Hitler's second major strategic offensive of the war. This time, not along three strategic axes toward Leningrad, Moscow, and Rostov, because he realizes he can't. The Wehrmacht cannot do that anymore. This one is along the southern axis. Although Hitler makes a mistake. It had been understood in the pre-war years that one army group, as a strategic entity, a war-winning formation, could operate along one strategic axis. That's what it would take, an army group. Soviets call army groups fronts. So, therefore, when the Germans entered in Barbarossa, they went along three axes, toward Leningrad in the north, toward Moscow, and toward Kiev. They had three army groups, north, center, and south. Now comes 42. We're going to mount a strategic operation along ostensibly one axis. Army group south too weak. And besides, when we get to here, we get to the Don River, we're going to go to Stalingrad, and we're going to go into the Caucasus. That's two strategic axes. Hitler solves the problem by splitting Army Group South into Army Group A and B. It is a fiction. They aren't full Army Groups. They're half Army Groups. And to make matters worse, once Blau opens and the Germans drive eastward to the Don River, now they confront three strategic axes. Stalingrad, the Caucasus, and Voronezh. They've only got two Army Groups. What's the solution? Those of you who have read about the Stalingrad operation know what the solution is. You throw a Romanian army, a Hungarian army, and an Italian army in. Add them to Army Group A. So here is the, the fatal flaw of Operation Blau. Nevertheless, Blau is spectacular, but it does give birth to several very distinctive myths. And since I'm working on a book on Stalingrad now, I'm going to just hit those for you very quickly before we move on to the other forgotten battles in the summer of 42. First flaw, first myth of Stalingrad. Soviet forces conducted a deliberate withdrawal opposite in contravention of what they'd done in 41, and hence were able to pull their forces out of harm's way. No, that is not correct. Operation Blau crushes six Soviet armies, utterly crushes six Soviet armies. The 40th, the 21st, the 38th, the 9th, and you can go down the list. There are two others. We have the 28th Army's records. One little note, and kind of file it away in the back of your mind for Stalingrad later. The 13th Guards Rifle Division, a Guards Rifle Division, begins Operation Blau with, with 10,000 men on the 28th of June. The 15th of July, it has 33 men left. And it's evacuated to the Urals for rest and refitting. Those of you who have read, read Craig's enemy at, enemy at the Gates will know that Rodimsev led his 13th Guards Rifle Division, an elite unit into Stalingrad, on what date? 9th of September. How long does it take to form a division? It's destroyed in the end of, by the middle of July. Its remnants flown back by the end of July. It's supposed to be combat ready in November. It goes into Stalingrad with 10,000 green men, three regiments, only one of which has rifles. And that's on the 19th, 9th of September. Flaw. Fallacy. 
Now, a lot of the Soviet troops do get back, and that's because, ultimately they get back, and that's because the Germans have insufficient infantry to surround the people they've encircled and contain them. That's where the myth is, that's what's given rise to the myth. The second myth, the road to Stalingrad was a relatively open one, free. German forces marched. The only thing that took a great toll on them was weather, climate, terrain, the heat of summer, and so on. Wrong! Throughout the advance, the Soviets mount two major counteroffensives and numerous counterstrokes trying to stop the advance of the Germans toward the Don. The first of these occurs up here in the Voronezh area with a brand new tank army, the 5th, in early July. History books had told us that they fought for five days. No, we now know they fought for 25 days. And at the end of July, they throw three tank armies in, the 5th up here and the 1st and 5th, the 1st and 4th down here along the Don River. 3,000 tanks go into action against a force about one-tenth their size, and they lose. As you get closer to Stalingrad in late, late July, as German forces are approaching the city, the Germans and drive a little wedge through to the city in the north. The, German, the Soviets mount counterstroke after counterstroke after counterstroke with a newly formed Stalingrad front. Four armies, four armies, first under Zhukov's control and then under Yeremenko's attacking in the region called Kutluban. First Kutluban, second Kutluban, third Kutluban, fourth Kutluban. All the way from the end of, end of August through early October, these offensives occur. They have horrendous casualty tolls, and they win terrain in 50 to 100 meters, perhaps as deep as a kilometer. We've got the, the daily maps now of the Soviet units and the German units. And yet, and this is typical Zhukov, typical Zhukov, batter, 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 because what does that do? That defeats the German force in Stalingrad before it even reaches the city. Paulus's plan was to use a Panzer Corps in the north, the 14th, a Panzer Corps in the south, the 48th, have them race into the city, the former seizing the factory districts, the southern, the latter, the southern part of the city. And when these attacks materialized at Kutluban, in late August and continue all the way through early October, one of those Panzer Corps is almost routed. Three divisions. Two motorized and a poncher division. And it never can take part in the attack on Stalingrad. This gives rise to the third myth, that Sixth Army attacked at Stalingrad with roughly 250,000 men. No more than a third of Sixth Army was ever involved in the fighting for the city. In every book that has been written on the Battle of Stalingrad for the last 30 years, has included in the German order of battle a 76th Infantry Division attacking into the city. Wasn't there. I finally discovered in my research why it's in all those books. Because Tchwikov put it in his book. He was the army commander that defended. He put it in his book in 1958, in the Russian edition. And you know what? It wasn't his fault. I now have the intelligence reports of the 62nd Army. And, and guess what? The, the Soviets did think the, 60, the 76th Infantry was there. This is how a fact can honestly make its way into a history book and then get propelled right on through. And there are legions of these facts in all the existing histories, these mistakes, I should say, in all the existing histories of Stalingrad. So, it was not unopposed, it was not a polite Soviet withdrawal, and the Sixth Army, and for that matter, Army Group A and B, lost before they ever got into the city fight at Stalingrad. Those are some of the myths, which I probably got ahead of myself, because here's the slide with the myths. Responsibility for the Red Army's May debacles. I didn't mention to you that in early May, before Operation Blau occurred, the Soviets launched two, launched two major offensives, one in the Crimea and one at Kharkov, designed to seize the strategic initiative. They made a mistake. Hitler had established a deception plan posturing the Wehrmacht's advance on Moscow when he, when he concentrated all of his armor in the south to use it for, the, for Operation Blau. Soviets didn't realize they bought the deception. They attacked in the south and in the process lost 250,000 men roughly in each of those two operations. This is why the Germans had such initial success in Operation Blau. Just like the year before when, when they begun the advance on Moscow and been helped in that process by a failed Soviet offensive, the same thing would happen in the summer of 42. Two failed Soviet offensives would produce huge losses and set the Soviet army, the Red Army, up for a defeat in the high summer. Hitler's strategy in Operation Blau, I've already covered that. 
misassessment of the strategic objectives and the creating of army groups that really weren't. And the Leningrad diversion, I didn't mention this, but after the fighting in the Crimea, in the summer, after Sevastopol, the fortress of Sevastopol falls, the Germans blithely send Monstein's 11th Army north to Leningrad to seize the city, while Paulus's forces seize Stalingrad. And we know, of course, what happened. Leningrad did not fall. The 11th Army was engaged by a brand new second shock army in, bat in fighting in July and August. And oh, by the way, the second, 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 second shock army was also encircled and destroyed in the fight. But guess what? It so damaged the 11th Army, it was unusable anywhere else. And it was sorely missed at Stalingrad when it was really needed toward the end. Winter campaign, November 42, March 43. I'm going to put this up because I want to show you one figure, and that is in November and December 42. This is Stalingrad. Seven Soviet armies, 83 divisions, 800 and, well, let me step back. Another fallacy of this war is that most people don't realize that there were two major operations, strategic offensives the Soviets launched in November. Not just Operation Uranus, which was Stalingrad, but also Operation Mars, which was fought in the Rzhev area west of Moscow. Zhukov had one, Vasilyevsky had the other. Uh, so if you see, you see these two paragraphs here, seven armies, 83 divisions, 815,000 men, 2,352 tanks, that's in, that's in Operation Mars. Here's Operation Uranus at Stalingrad. 17 armies, 1.1 million men, 160 divisions, 3,500 tanks, badly damaged or destroyed five Axis armies, including two German, totally more than 50 divisions, and killing and capturing more than 600,000 Axis troops. Compare this with North Africa. This is El Alamein. 20 Allied divisions, 300,000 men, 15 German and Italian divisions, 275,000 men driven into Tunisia. And the numbers there are uh, illustrative of our misunderstanding of the relative weights of the two fronts. I might add in passing that, that, that all of these numbers and all of these pages and all of these graphics are in a short study that I've written and marked as a self-published publication. But I, when I go out and give this talk, since I can never finish it, I also leave a copy of the publication with the people who invite me to talk with a promise that they can use it in any way they see fit and hand it out to anybody that wants it. So if anybody wants a copy of the study from which all this is taken, and wants to hear the numbers I'm not able to articulate tonight, I will leave this behind, and if the center's capable of doing so, they can make you a copy. The winter campaign. This is the campaign of uh, the Stalingrad counteroffensive. This is also the campaign where later on, after Soviet forces advanced westward toward Kharkov, General von Manstein called back from Leningrad area, where he commanded the 11th Army, did not take command of Army Group South, the first Army Group Don, and then Army Group South, mounts a very brilliant counterstroke. Now, historians have called that a counterstroke against Soviet forces in the Donbass. When in actuality, because of the strategic impact of his actions, it should be a counteroffensive. Why do I say that? Because roughly two thirds of Soviet Offensive action undertaken in the winter campaign of 42-43 has gone utterly unreported for 50, over 50 years. What am I talking about? We know about the Donbass operation. We know about it grudgingly because the Germans wrote a lot about it, and therefore the Soviet historians had to put something in about the operation. What we don't know, what we didn't know but now know, is that right after the 2nd of February, when Paulus' army in Stalingrad surrendered, the entire Don Front, commanded by future Marshal Wachosovsky, was moved westward, transformed into the Central Front, and launched a major offensive along this axis toward the Dnieper River, due west, in an attempt to split the entire German Eastern Front apart. Not only was that front involved, also the Kalinin Front, the Western Front, and the Bryansk Front were also involved. This fighting in February and March was, of course, in bad season of the year. It did falter badly, but it was an attempt to win a strategic victory of major proportions in the winter of 42-43. And oh, by the way, there was one up here, too, forgotten. This is Operation Polar Star, 
designed to, take, to kick off at the same time as the major offensive here. This one to be commanded by Zhukov, who went up to take personal charge. And it was designed to destroy Army Group North, relieve Leningrad, and drive German forces back into the Baltic state. This operation, too, faltered. And it has fallen into the category of a forgotten battle. What are the myths in this period? Stalin's strategic intent in November 42. This is the question about one or two strategic offensive strokes. Was it just Stalingrad or was it Stalingrad and, and Rezhev? Was it just Uranus? Was it Uranus and Mars? We have the answer to that question now. It was both. The rescue of Sixth Army. Hitler has been brutally criticized for failing to rescue Paulus's Sixth Army. We now know that given the Soviet forces in the field, specifically the uh, Second Guards Army, Malinovsky's Army, and given the, the terrible situation and condition in Paulus's Sixth Army after its fight in Stalingrad City, there was no way on God's green earth that Sixth Army could have broken out or the paltry division sent north from Army Group A could have broken in to rescue him. The full extent of the Soviet winter offensive, I've already covered that. We only know one-third of, of what happened during the winter. Impact of Monstein's February counterstroke, it was strategic in impact rather than just operational. And as I mentioned earlier, Stalingrad indicates the Germans are going to lose the war. The only question is how badly. Summer of 43 is the campaign of Kursk and the great Soviet advance to the Dnieper River post-Kursk. Uh, I want to highlight just a couple of uh, forgotten battles here. This is the stage of the war where Soviet history traditionally states, beginning in the, in the summer of 43, we carefully chose our strategic axes. We did not mount operations against multiple axes at the same time. That is patently incorrect. And the case in note is post-Kursk 1940. Now, you know Kursk was begun as a Soviet offensive. For the first time in the war, the Soviets planned a counteroffensive before the German attack commenced. And they indeed began their counteroffensive the day after the tank battle at Prokhorovka. And by the middle of the summer, the entire front was ablaze from west of Moscow all the way to the Black Sea with every Soviet front on the attack. We also know that when the Soviets reached the Dnieper River. They fought very heavy battles to get across the Dnieper. What we don't know is that at the same time in October of 1942, and we now have all the orders, the Stavka ordered the Western Front, the Kalinin Front, which became First Baltic, and the, Bel the Central Front, which became Belarusian, to, to liberate Belarusia and seize Minsk. And that led to tremendous battles that lasted not only through the rest of the summer-fall campaign, but also through the winter campaign of 43-44. And almost all those battles have been forgotten. There's a special reason for it. The command of the Belarusian Front was a chap named Rokossovsky. Rokossovsky did quite well in the offensive. And if you see the lines there, his front pushed forward into southern Belarusia to rather inhospitable terrain to considerable depths. However, in the north, in the center part, in the western port, front did very badly. Ten separate offensives it launched, with losses exceeding 500,000 men over eight months. The commander of that front was Zhukov's former chief of staff, Sokolovsky, now Western Front commander. Why was this operation covered up? Who was chief of the Soviet general staff in 1960? And a, a rising figure prior to it. Those of you who remember Khrushchev will remember the man who articulated his nuclear strategy, Sokolovsky's Boyanaya Strategia, military strategy. This operation, this offensive was covered up to protect a reputation. In fact, Zhukov stepped in. Zhukovsky was relieved. We have the order now. February 1944, relieved the command and ordered back to Moscow. Zhukov stepped in and brought him ultimately to, to become chief of staff of his first, Bel of his first Belarusian front when it operated in Poland and finally in Berlin in 45. So Zhukov rescued Sokolovsky, and after the war, Sokolovsky rose, and rose to the extent that to protect his reputation, the Belarusian operation was quite literally erased from history. <clears throat> as far as the miss in the summer fall campaign, 
the timing, wisdom, and feasibility of Hitler's Operation Citadella. That's the Kursk Offensive. A lot has been written about that. And, and frankly, uh, first, it's not really important when he attacked. Had he attacked earlier, on the heels of Manstein's counteroffensive in February and March, German forces were in no capability. We had no capability of whatsoever of sustaining their operations forward. Basically, this is bogus. There's a lot more reasons, but I'm running out of time. The broad front strategy, I think from the map I showed you, you can see that Stalin's strategy was a broad front one and not a narrow point, and the Battle of Kursk is a turning point I've already addressed. The winter campaign of 43-44, many of the same features of the campaign before. Now, here are uh, the operations that most Soviet books and current Russian books concentrate on. These are the operations in the Ukraine. Uh, the official Soviet view is that in the winter of 43-44, we concentrated all of our efforts in Ukraine and did nothing elsewhere except an early preliminary offensive up here in the north. In actuality, we had the same situation we had the previous fall. A huge offensive in Belarus, and as you can see from the map here, if you squint, not many gains at all. So this is an unsuccessful offensive and one that has literally fallen from the pages of history. I add a footnote because I just wrote a book on this. At the tail end of this operation, in April 1944, when Soviet forces are along the Prut River in northern Romania, Romania, the orders go out for the first and second Ukrainian, excuse me, third and fourth Ukraine, second and third Ukrainian fronts in that theater to initiate a major offensive to liberate Romania and the oil fields. In fact, they launched two separate offensives, the second Ukrainian front in an area known as Targol Frumos. The Germans have taught this at the Ferings Academy for 45 years as a tactical case in how you defeat a large Soviet tank force. It's a division-level exercise. They had no knowledge this thing was as big as it was. It had the entire 2nd Guards Tank Army, part of 5th Guards Tank Army, and a lot of separate tank corps in the Soviet force structure, including two tank regiments equipped with the new Joseph Stalin tank. This was no small force launching this offensive, and it did fail. And my book is entitled Red Storm Over the Balkans. It alters all of our previous concepts about the linkages between military policy and political aims in the war. And it indicates a very strong interest on in the part of Stalin in the Balkans much earlier than we ever assumed. <coughs> summer of 44. This is the grand operation in the summer of 44 when German army group after German army group are destroyed. One after the other beginning uh, <coughs> in June. And you would say, well, at this stage of the war, since the Soviets launched multi-front offensives, first in Belarus on the 22nd of June, then towards southern Poland a week later, and finally into Romania in early August, that they can't hide anything in this. Uh, yes, indeed, they do. And the forgotten battles of this particular operation occur at the end of these successful offensives, because having destroyed Army Group Center, quite literally destroyed it, having badly damaged Army Group North Ukraine and having badly damaged Army Group South Ukraine, in October, the orders will go out from the Stavka to exploit these successes here in East Prussia and here in Eastern Hungary. And those are the two failed operations that were originally strategic in intent and have been forgotten since the war. Uh, this operation in fact, was launched. We now have the records of the armies participating in that. It involved a very majestic effort by German commanders to scrounge up armored forces sufficient to halt this drive sort of the city of Königsberg. The area down here involves a very deep operation by a, the most vaunted of all the Soviet cavalry mechanized groups, General Pliev, uh, a huge exploitation in northern Hungary only to be surrounded and almost and very severely handled by counterattacking German and Hungarian forces, short of his objective. <clears throat> the myths at this point, Stalin's strategic intent, I just covered that when I mentioned Romania, and, and his intent to go further than his forces actually did in the campaign. Hitler's stand-past policy finally comes back to haunt him. 
because what had succeeded in the winter of 41 and 42 <coughs> had failed at Stalingrad, although he didn't tell Paulus to stand fast. Paulus simply decided to. But by 44, telling German infantry to stand fast in cities like Vitebsk, Mogilov, and Babryusk was a death sentence, as tens of thousands of German soldiers learned. And the Warsaw Uprising, here is one case where I'm going to side with the Soviet view somewhat. It has been, part in part because of the Cold War, it has been politic to say that Stalin deliberately denied assistance to the Poles in Warsaw because he wanted the Polish Home Army to lose. When in fact we now know that, I can call it the map here, if I had a more detailed map of this, of this area, this is Warsaw right here, <coughs> you would see that in late July, Stalin, after Soviet forces reached the Vistula River south of Warsaw, Stalin drastically alters his strategy and orders his second tank army northward toward the city, supported by 70th and 47th armies. At the time, the nearest Soviet forces are still fighting with German forces in western Belarusia. Somehow, Field Marshal Modell, who sent back and given command of Army Group Center, manages to put together a, a, a rather striking assault force of dilapidated Panzer divisions, I think it's the 9th, the 19th, and Totenkopf. And it turns out, and a huge anti-tank unit formed up of anti-tank guns seized from security and police units. And he had about 350 guns, from what I understand. And he turns this entire force on the Second Guards Tank Army as it advances on Warsaw. We have Second Guards Tank Army's records. It get, got within 10 miles of the city. Two of its corps, its two tank corps, were badly handled, losing 80% of their armor. Its mechanized corps barely managed to hang on, and the supporting forces from 70th Army were simply too weak. Now, that delayed the Soviet advance on Warsaw for about a month. Now, by the time you get to September, when this front closes along this line, then you have a little more grounds for criticizing Stalin uh, for fa failing to aid the Poles in the Warsaw Uprising. Uh, <clears throat> it would have, however, involved a wholesale reorientation of all the strategic objectives that the Stavka had and Stalin had uh, assigned to the Red Army, namely the advance toward East Prussia and the advance across central Poland or southern Poland uh, to go for Warsaw proper. The last campaign of the war, and we'll do this very quickly because I'm rapidly running out of time. Uh, this is the 1945 winter campaign, April 45. Uh, the final, now there are, there are some forgotten battles, believe it or not, even at this late stage of the war. For example, let me, this isn't a forgotten battle per se, but it's something that has begged explanation for years. If you read Soviet books, history books, and a lot of English books, you'll <coughs> see in it a debate over whether the Soviet army should have moved on Berlin on the 2nd of February, that is, days after it reached and crossed the Oder River 60 mile, 30 miles from Berlin's outskirts at the end of its Vistula Oder operation. Clearly, it could have done so. And you have in the memoirs, Soviet memoirs, Konyev and Konyev, uh, Konyev and Zhukov in particular, a debate over whether it was wise to halt our advance on Berlin when we did. Most of the standard Soviet histories say they halted the advance on the 2nd of February because Soviet forces were overextended. Two, there was a concentration of SS forces in Pomerania. And three, we were running low on supplies and ammunition. We had to regroup. Regroup for three months. At the time, there was one, there were both Sturm units and one uh, along the Oder River and one Panzer Grenadier Division about 80 miles west west, heading east at full steam. In other words, there was nothing between the Soviets and Berlin. So for years, we, people, historians have wondered, why didn't they go for Berlin in February? We now know why. The answer is diplomatic. When was Yalta held? Anybody know? Yalta Conference. February 8th, 9th, 10th. At Yalta, what did we agree to? Partition of and what else? Anything else? Spheres of influence in Germany. There was one place left now. Spheres of influence. Who will have what influence in Poland, Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania, so on and so forth. One area left out. Ostmark. Austria. 
Vienna in the heart of the Danube being based. We now have the orders issued to Zhukov's first, Ukra uh, first Belarusian and Konya's first uh, Ukrainian front. Two February, the orders. Guess where the orders send those two fronts? Berlin is the final objective. And yet, on the 9th, 8th or 9th, orders go out saying, halt. Halt. Why? Uh, I, I would argue what, what occurred at Yalta is why. And if you look at Soviet strategic transfers of forces thereafter, throughout February and March, they are all into Hungary, the most important of which being the 9th Guards Army, the Airborne Army, made up of Guards Airborne Divisions, redesignated the 9th Guards Army. It was sent into Hungary to the Budapest area with orders to form up besides Pliev's cavalry mechanized group, huge conglomeration of cavalry corps and mechanized corps, and the 6th Guards Tank Army, and they were not to get involved in any defensive operations. So when the Germans attack at Balatang, the last offensive, early March 1945, some of you recall it, they go hardly anywhere. Guess who they hit? The 27th Army? The 37th Army? They hit second-rate armies. Three second-rate armies dug in deep. And the second-rate armies bring them to a halt. And the moment they are brought to a halt, a la Kursk, all of those forces, including the Ninth Guards Army, go over to the offensive north of Budapest, and their destination is Vienna. Vienna falls on... When do we, when did the Soviets go on Berlin? Anybody recall the date? 16th of April. A day after Vienna falls. There's your answer as to why, I think, there's your answer as to why uh, they call a halt to the offensive on Berlin in February. Now, it does cost them considerable casualties. They wouldn't have suffered, I doubt they'd have suffered 375,000 dead as they did in April if they'd attacked in February. Issues. Stalin's strategic intent, I mentioned that in the context of the Danubian Basin in Hungary. A book needs to be written on that. There's simply no time to write it. The race for Berlin and Prague. This is another argument, uh, a what if. There are lots of what ifs on the Eastern Front. What if we, we, we'd unleashed Patton and sent him into Czechoslovakia. What if we'd unleashed Bradley and sent him toward, or the First Army and sent him toward Berlin? I did a little exercise one time because I thought it would be fun and I had some time on my hands. And I did a lay down of Soviet forces on the 16th, 15th of April and Soviet, for, uh, Soviet and U.S. forces. And then I said, okay, I'm going to war game this thing. What if the order was go? And then I went. And I played it all the way through the end. And guess what? Berlin was divided, uh, they, albeit we had a bit more. And, of course, the press, uh, I, I think I closed the article with a note. Eisenhower walks into the hotel room in, in Berlin and looks down at the paper, and it says, Allied forces occupy West Berlin. Cold War begins. What changes in history? Well, that is a very, very rapid run-through of very, very complicated war, but it will have to do because we're out of time. Uh, a couple of key points at the end. The impact of the war. The Red Army defeated the 20th centuries. And you can read this thing as well as I, I hope you can. My, my eyes are getting bad, but you folks in the back read that? Okay. Stalin called it an atomic war, and I would agree. Those are the effects on the Soviet Union. And the bulk of the Wehrmacht was defeated in the East. Hitler's thousand-year Reich perished in 12 years. The Red Army emerged as the world's premier killing machine. However, it, it proved as deadly, if not more so, for the Soviet Army and its Red Army soldiers than it did for the Germans. The Soviet Union emerged as the dominant power, one of the world's two superpowers. And this slogan, no one has forgotten, nothing will be forgotten. I believe this fixation on defense on defense, because you can never, never answer the question of how much do you require for defense, is what ultimately bankrupted the Soviet state and brought it down in 1991. Questions?
structure of the second Shah Army as a sham. So that uh, system you're in. It was destroyed twice. So it was reconstructed in three months. Yes. To be destroyed again. Yes. So the purpose. Yes. 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 Y
That's wrong. It wasn't over. Now, why wasn't it over? Yes, Russians are mad. Now, a lot of Belarusians and Ukrainians would have supported the Germans. The Germans, Germans suffer from their arrogance. The arrogance of the nationality policy which alienates a host of potential friends and which makes them inherently underestimate the Slavic foes. Therefore, even if they don't destroy the whole Red Army west of the Divina, you'll see German generals who, if you kind of boil it up and say, well, we got a lot of them. There's still a lot more out there, but we'll, we'll get them. And then you get the Smolensk in, in August, and yeah, we got a lot more, but there are more, but we'll get them. And then you get to October and November, the big encirclements west of my, God, we got up, they're down to their last battalion, Halder writes. No, no, they're down to their last six armies in reserve. They're just about ready to unleash on you. Now, these aren't big armies. There are a lot of people carrying rifles, some of them not very modern ones. They don't have proper machine guns. And, uh, and, but they count. Quality has a quantity, quantity has a quality of its own. One thing Stalin will do and the Soviet system does that Hitler does not do, and he doesn't do it through arrogance, not because he wouldn't if he realized he had to, is he immobilized their economy ruthlessly and totally to the war effort. And that gets you into women at war. All the constraints on who serves go. They go. Georgians, Uzbeks, you're all welcome. Women, you're not going to be just, just uh, nurses and doctors and drivers. You're going to be anti-aircraft gunners and, and uh, Venus, uh, the air observation and, and reporting system watchers. You're going to, two million of them get in. They do what has to be done, and they do it ruthlessly. Hitler, I don't have to do that. I don't have to produce 2,000 tanks a month. We're superior. We're Germans. And that, in the end, catches up with them. And you see it in the diaries of German soldiers. There's one, one good diary that came out. I can't remember the title. Where, where this guy is cocky right up to the 5th of December, 41. And then he's dead on the 7th. But the 6th, his letter is rather, rather pessimistic. God, my world's falling apart around me. He dies. And that's why I guess they sent his, they sent his diary home or whatever. No, they have no idea. And this is, people ask me, what is the single most important factor in the Soviet victory in 41 and 42? Mobilization, number one. I mean, aside from not collapsing, mobilization is number one. They're able to mobilize. I mean, the, Soviet intel, the German intelligence has no idea what the Soviet Union can mobilize. You saw the 831 divisions or 800 odd divisions. Okay, you got a better expert right here than me, both of them actually, than me, but, but I'll take a hop at it and then you, they can add something or contradict me. Uh, they have an opening, yes. Uh, they began by systematically releasing materials and having them printed in bound volumes, printed by various presses. And they were doing fine with that. Uh, they were doing, you know, they had 25 volumes of these things out. Stavka Order, you know, Headquarters Supreme High Command, NKO, uh, People's Commissary of Defense, uh, every category you can imaginable, and plus battle books. One's on Kursk, one's on Berlin, one's on... The, and suddenly, about 1998, the, the process stopped. Uh, I think because the Forgotten Battles books came out, personally. And I don't want to ascribe too much to my writings, but I think they said, uh-uh, enough of this crap. The reason I say that is I wrote an article, a rather innocent article in a journal, I forget which journal it was in, and I entitled it, Prelude to Kursk, and it was about the massive Soviet offensive toward the Dnieper. It was going on at the same time von Meinstein orchestrated his counterstroke. And it was innocent enough. It didn't, it didn't take him to it didn't have Zhukov involved. And so they came out with a volume. Right within a month, they came out with a volume in that series that was entitled Prelude to Kursk. It had all the documents I would have loved to have had when I wrote the article. But then I came out with, with, with Operation Mars, Zhukov's greatest event. Publishers always take a book and they put some preposterous, uh, they, they want a sensational headline. Uh, mine was covered, titled something that like, like a colonel would call it, Rishev Shichevka Offensive, you know, the name of the offensive. <laughs> they called it Zhukov's Greatest Defeat. Well, that, that gets your attention. And boy, it got the Russians' attention. They got madder than hell over that. 
They really did. They haven't forgiven me since. A lot of them haven't. Although there are a lot of, a lot of them now writing support for me. So I'm winning the battle. But on the other hand, I think I'm winning the battle for the wrong reason. I think I'm winning the battle because they want to, I think Putin's waging a war against the Communist Party to discredit it because it's his only potential major contender in the future. But anyway, I'm way off the, the topic again. Did I answer your question? One over here. On the right before the left. I've got to keep left-right balance here. idea what the real truth is. Uh, I'm getting facetious. Uh, yeah, the question was, there were, when Soviet forces swept into, can I keep going? I've long exceeded my time. When Soviet forces swept into Eastern Europe, Poland, Germany, they liberated a lot of prisoner war camps where American, German prisoner war camps where American were being held prisoner. Uh, what is the fate of those Americans who were liberated by the Soviets? Is that right? We have a, there's a book out. I can't remember the title. Uh, does anybody recall the title of this book that was written by an American? It was a, a Brit, actually. Maybe that's why it's not an American book. There's a book out there somewhere written by, a, I returned to Odessa or something, about a German Brit who was rescued who went to Odessa and then was taken out of Odessa, kind of a reverse of Kiel Hall. Uh, the shipment of, of Soviet POWs back to the Soviet Union. But my impression is, I'm, I'm batting, beating all over the my impression is they treated U.S. prisoners of war well, and British too. We were their allies, and, and I've seen a number of folks who, who came out, who were liberated by Russians and said, they did a good job for us. We had, I didn't even know this, we had liaison officers in, serving in Russian forces. Some Russian forces. I, I have a Memoir written by our official declassified G2 report from a U.S. major of cavalry riding with Pliev's cavalry mechanized group in the fall of 44. I couldn't believe it. He's serving with it. That, that's the best I can do. I will tell you that uh, I've just finished editing a memoir by the father of a close friend of mine who's done a lot of work for me in Russia. He's a U Ukrainian who was working in Russia in 1991 with a, at Moscow State University and working in the archives on special topics for, for the Gorbachev government. And uh, his father was Alexei, and he was uh, in the Red Army, captured in the summer of 42 at Voronezh during Operation Blau, sent back to Germany, sp uh, spent several, three years in German POW camps, was sent then to airfields uh, in Belgium and Holland, was liberated by U.S. forces in September 44, spent some time in U.S. internment, which he loved, incidentally, and then was shipped to England for further internment and was, and he's pretty explicit about this, and I believe him because his, father, his son has gone back and got all his Smirsh documents, too. All his Smirsh, uh, death, to sp uh, death to Spies documents. He, he said, I'm going back to Russia. And he says categorically, we did not have to go back. We were given a choice, and a lot of my friends stayed. So all these books on Keel Hall, which was the supposed forced repatriation, I think need to be relooked at. He went back and ended up going into the infiltration system run by Smirsch, went, which is the Gulag, more or less, and went through reserve rifle divisions where he was then sent back down to work in industry in, ba in Baku and so on. He got out and returned to the village in Ukraine in 49, and he found out that he got out that, that it wasn't that he was being held against his will. They just didn't tell him. They said, oh, you could have gone, you could have left two years before if you'd asked. It's kind of an interesting punchline. I think I got two, but that, anybody had a question that we, we get cut off and I'll stick around. Yeah. I noticed somebody who was an American uh, intelligence sergeant who was captured by the Germans 
where the camp was to be screened by the Russians, and the Russians signed the time it wasn't on the air, they were signing out to shoot them. They said, you are now on the flight, probably stuff with a loader on a T-34 for about two months. Okay. That's, that's kind of ensuring the second part operation. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was wondering what kind of numbers uh, of women in the... Yeah, uh, about two million total women in service. Uh, a large chunk of those are traditional uh, doctors, nurses, drivers, telephonists, uh, communications workers, but, and we have all the orders now, they, they, they come out. Beginning in the winter of 41, beginning in early 42, Stalin begins sending out orders, you will replace military men in PBO. Protivo Vice Duznaya Oberona, uh, anti aircraft defense, with women and send those folks in, into the rifle divisions. And there's a steady process of moving women into combat, to military positions to send men to the front. That goes on quite a ways. And in addition to that, what Rihanna was going to talk about were the aviation regiments, mostly night bomber aviation regiments, three of them, but also an I with PO2 plywood bombers, night bombers, but also. Uh, there's 600,000 in the MPBO. That's local anti-aircraft defense, which is a formal organization defending Moscow, defending Leningrad, other centers, and the system moves west as the war proceeds, and they create new, new PBO regions and brigades. But uh, about two million altogether, sir. Oh, I, I, I missed I missed the most important group, the first women's rifle brigade, based in Moscow. That's the only actual formation that I've seen in the Red Army with a, with a woman designation. That's a sniper training brigade, because the, the Russians learned they made very good snipers. And if you've read Shuikov's books, you'll know there were famous women snipers. They did do quite well. And I'll tell you, I've seen my younger daughter shoot. And she can hit the eye of a pigeon at 200 yards. So they're right. And so they, this was a women snipers were routinely assigned out to the combat fronts and armies. I think I some I think some reached colonel. I can't tell you for sure. Uh, their, their service was covered up after the war. I don't know how intentional it was, but it was covered up. Maybe embarrassment we had to use so many women. I, I, that might explain it as well. <laughs> yeah, you can't lose 14.7 million men and run out of people. Yeah, I mean, they, they raised the limits to, to 60 and lowered them down to about as low as you can get. And I'm not sure we know the floor. Uh, all, the pre all, all the prohibitions on minorities were lifted. I think I think Chechen was the only thing you couldn't fight, because Chechens rose up, and, and a lot of the Turkmens and Chechens fought in German unit, units. Uh, but, but, yeah, they, they were, the Soviets formed blocking detachments. Zagrad Itonai Atriadi in 42. Everybody knows their mission, one of their missions, which was to stand behind units and shoot them if they, if they retreated. You saw that if you watched Enemy at the Gates. That's, that's accurate. It happens. I just finished a map today of 13th Guards Rifle Division on the 8, 19th of September in Central City, Stalingrad. And by golly, there's the 2nd of the 34th and 1st of the 39th and battalion, blocking battalion. Now, they're right on the maps. But the other mission was to get recruits. And so when they go rolling through Kursk, and this is the, the Akavakasovsky's drive in the upper that failed. They do take Kursk. They wrote, and I got a, a report from the 48th Rifle Brigade complaining, the blocking detachment sent us 450 recruits from Kursk. They must have got them out of cellars and, and, and everywhere, and they're unfit for military duty. And you know, they're forced to integrate them into the... It does create a problem. I'm sure many Romanians, many Ruthanians, many Eastern Europeans end up in the, in the Red Army because they are short manpower. It's a problem when they go to Manchuria in 45 in response to Truman's request for the help. They field forces out there, and I've got Galitsky, who's a particularly good army commander, 39th Army, who writes his memoirs, to a detailed account of, of not only the morale problems of sending folks from the West to fight in the East after they've survived this thing, that, that well, six out of ten don't survive, but they're also too doggone young. They're green, 15 years perhaps. You didn't get into numbers, but that's what you infer. And if anybody's got any more questions, I'm willing to stick around as long as you want. <laughs>